Welcome. In this video, we're going to go over setup and the basics of how to play Warhammer Quest Curse City. So Curse City is a cooperative campaign driven dungeon crawler for one to four players in which you'll be a band of heroes trying to take down the undead tyrant Radikar the Wolf. Um, so timestamps would be down below. What I'm basically going to do is go over all the components we have, go through the basic setup to get the game started, go through your basic actions, and then do a rundown of a turn sequence. So of course we've got our main rule book that's going to give us the majority of everything we need in the game. There's a quest book that's going to go over some of the history, story, and then just setting up for the different types of quests we'll be going through. And of course, the minis that came in the game were not put together, so there's a guide letting you show how to put those together and recommendations for painting. And some more scrolls in case you go into the Age of Sigmar world and you want to use these miniatures in your other games. But as it relates to this gameplay, we've got lots of miniatures that I've already put together, most of them, and painted some. A bunch of dual-sided tiles that we'll be using to setting up a map, and I'm going to ahead and put together one of the pre-constructed maps. Several tokens we'll be using for the game. Uh, so going over levels, damage, different conditions we can get, inspiration, fear, influence, experience, and some other tokens. So with our maps, they are in square grids for us to go on, so large Figures can go in one spot, and small figures you can have two in one location. They're connected by doorways, so this is an open doorway, and with the red line, it's closed. And the way those work, if they're at a spot adjoining two, these two spaces are adjacent to those two. But if it's just a single going across, like with this one, just these two spaces are adjacent. We have our sky bustle board. And then a token for tracking the daylight. As turns progress, this go around, and when it gets to the nighttime space, uh, our creatures are going to be more powerful. And then this inner circle here is for tracking objectives. And we have two areas here for placing our destiny dice when we roll them. And speaking of dice, plenty of those. So lots of D6s and specialty and a destiny die. So this is a D12, the destiny dice. Then of course we have our attack dice. So we've got D6s. Uh, you've got one side with a success, a critical success, and then all the other four on the D6 are blanks. Then we have D8s. It's gonna have four blanks on that, then two with a success and two with a crit success. Then we have a D12 here which is going to have, I think, one, two, three, four or five misses, and then a whole lot of other hits. So this is a die we definitely want to be rolling. Then all the white dice are going to be activation dice. Most characters are going to be rolling four of those, and depending on how they spend their dice, they can do different actions. Then our destiny dice will be rolled each turn to give our party some additional actions. So we'll take a look at our characters. So there are four different classes of characters here. So we've got two blades, then two lore masters, two executioners, and two stalwart characters. On one side is showing their path to glory. Throughout the game, they can get inspiration to flip over to their better side. So just taking a quick look, we have four spots for our action dice we can put there. Also, as we take wounds, we'll put them there, which means we get less dice. Let us know our size. All our characters are large. Our stats for movement. Our regular move, basically spinning a die with one up, we get to move three spaces. If we spin a die of a cost three or higher, we get to go four. Then for vitality, defense, and agility, it's just letting us know which dice we'll be rolling. We can carry one item. We've got a spot for traits, which we'll get as we level up. We have a spot down here for armor and weapons. We can have one in each slot. Then going over our weapons, the die we need to spend to use them, if it's melee or ranged or dual. So some are just range only. Melee, you can attack an adjacent spot and dual can be used as both. The die you roll for each and the damage they do for a success and damage for a crit success and unique abilities they might have. 
So we've got the Captain Imelda Braskoff here. And then on our other side, see her damage gets up and she's rolling some different dice. And her dice changes on her stats. Then we have Glorio Van Alten III and all his abilities. Octrin Glimscry. Of course, when you make your party, doesn't matter how many people are playing, you need to have four characters in. And you don't need to split them up having one of each character class. You can break them down however you want. Because throughout the game, some people may die, so you might not have an option to have one of each. And we have Quelleth the Exile. Chelson Derrick. Dagni Holdenstock. Fun names to pronounce here. And Brutog Corpse Eater. And then for each of the enemies we'll face, they're going to have their daytime form. And then when it gets to nighttime, you'll flip them over and they're all going to be a little bit more dangerous. So on each of these cards, you're going over the movement, how many wounds it takes to defeat them, the size. So once again, if they're a large creature, you can only have one in the spot. And if they are small, you can have two in one square. Their weapon they're using, type, dice, and damage, any special rules. And then when it's their turn to activate, you roll a die to see what their behavior is going to be. So you can see we've got some Wolf and Watch on both sides of their card. Some Corpse Rats. Some Bat Swarms. Dead Walker Zombies. The Verkos Bloodborne. Kasorgi Guard. The Varg Skier. The Watch Captain Halgrim. Turgillus the Chamberlain. Gorslav the Gravekeeper. And Radikar the Wolf. So we also have our quest card that's going to keep track of our fear and influence in the city. So when you start the game, you're going to start with five fear and six influence. The game is over. You'll lose the whole quest if either of these get to 10. And you can also track any of the characters that become decapitated. So if they ever come back up in the game, you can see if someone's dead, if they can show up. And then following up on our traits that some of our characters can have. So we've got traits for stalwart, executioner characters, and then blade and lore master characters. So basically we all start at level zero. As we level up, we'll get different abilities. And you see we max out at level five in this game. Then looking at some of our cards. We have encounter cards, so when the game starts, we're going to get random groups of enemies on the board. So we'll be picking one of these cards at random. We'll shuffle and then draw one. Let's us know at what level our party is at, how many enemies of a group is going to come out. So that's going to determine the random monsters for our battles. Then we have exploration cards. So one of the quest types we can take. It's not going to be a standard setup map. It's going to be randomly generated. So you'll be drawing different cards to see how that gets set up. And more discards. Basically, they're just letting us know if a character dies, you'll put that in with that character. So you know you can never play with that character again. Then we have discovery cards. When you set this deck to start up for the first game, you're going to run a remove uh, two Realm Stone value ones, then three value twos and two value threes. Take those out of the deck to start with. And the rest of that deck is going to have more Realm Stones, some traps and treasures that we can find during our adventures. And empowerment cards. As we level up, we can spend Realm Stone points to get some empowerments for our weapons and armor. So after each adventure, we'll see if we have any of that left and power up at the end of each adventure. 
got a leader token. If you're playing with multiple people, sometimes the leader is going to determine certain things that can be done. And a suffocating grave tide token. One of the adventurers will be running away from that like crazy. And we have some initiative tokens we'll be given to our characters. So that's a quick look at all the components and what they look like. So for setup and starting a new adventure, first thing you're gonna do is pick someone to be your leader. So that'll be me. We'll get one of those characters with that here shortly. We need to pick a journey. There are several different journey types we can go on. And those will be hunt journeys, scavenge journeys, deliverance journeys, and decapitation journeys. And they do recommend starting with a hunt journey, which is what we'll do. So we'll go to page 19 in the book. Basically, it's letting you know how to get ready. It does start with rolling a die to set up a map. I've already put up the Barrow Lane, as that is the smallest map they have. And that will fit on my table, and it's good to show setup. Each of the red dots is going to show where a mysterious object will go, and that's where enemies will start. And it's going to let you know how to set up the board, where your doors go, and lich gates, and whether the doors are open or closed. So the closed door is where we need to go to get out once we've completed our mission. And this token here, or tile, is where everyone will start the game. So the objects are where our enemy groups will start, and these lich gates will be where the reinforcements will be deployed. So go ahead and get these out of the way for now. So picking our heroes, like I said, we're always going to have four. I'm going to choose to play with Brutog, uh, Dagni, and Jelson. And let's bring in Glorio. And we'll go ahead and make him our leader. So once we have each of those picked, we're going to take some of these initiative tokens and just assign them however we want to these characters. Basically, that's just letting us know what initiative card is going to go with what hero. So with the initiative cards, they're, they're smaller ones like this with that back. Uh, so they don't have their faces of the characters. It's just going to go with the symbol. So when this initiative comes up, that's letting us know we've chosen Jelson to go with that symbol. So each of these goes with one of our heroes. And then these are going to be for the monsters. And they'll let us know the monsters assigned to our combat track up here. Monster one, two, three, and four. So here we've got monster four, three, two, and one. So that's how our initiative will be set. So basically these will be shuffled up. And at the beginning of every round, We will place these cards out and it's going to let us see how the initiative for the turn will go. Got our sky vessel board set up with our trackers on both spots. Set up your quest card, like I said, five with fear, six of influence. This is something that probably doesn't have to be on screen for the entire game. So we'll have that set to the side, but we know what those are. Going to build the discovery deck, taking out the cards I showed you before. Basically, they'll just be shuffled, and whenever we uh, do a search action, we'll get one of these at random. And we'll take the encounter cards and give them a shuffle. And since we had three red dots on the map for setup, we placed out those three mysterious um, objects. We're going to get three monsters coming out. So we'll put those in one, two, three. First, we're going to get two Didwalker zombies. And they will activate with the one. Then we're going to get a Watch Captain Halgrim, who will activate with the two. And then lastly, we're going to get three Elfin Watch that will activate with the three. And we'll set those to the side. Got our dice ready. Boards are already set up. So speaking of adjacency for the boards, you're adjacent to every spot diagonally and orthogonally to you. And if you're near a spot next to a door that's connected at a line, these two spots are adjacent to those two spots. 
And in something like this, you're just adjacent to this one, along with these three, not the one over to the side. Spaces can only carry, have one large miniature in them, or two small in a space. Friendly characters can move through their own troops, cannot move through enemy troops, and could not find anything on these. So I'm saying they block movement, but not line of sight. So for line of sight, basically you can see any creature that is on your same map tile. If you are at a doorway, you can see any creature on your tile or any creature in the adjoining doorway. And if you're on a tile, you can see any creature in your tile and any creature at an adjoining door. So that is targeting. So this spot here is our drop zone, which is where we'll start. So we're gonna take our four starting characters and place them at the door. So we've got Jelson, Glorio, Corpse Eater, and Dagni. And then for our enemy groups, the first group was two Deadwalker zombies. So they're gonna to go to the closest one and they go in adjacent spaces. And when they're small, they try to stay in the same square. So we'll place those there. And the watch captain is next closest. And then the Olfen watch, they come in three different varieties. We've got regular skeletons, sergeants and a flag bearer. And there are some setup instructions for those. So a hostile group that contains any Elfin watch cannot include more than one sergeant or more than one banner bearer. In addition, if a group has four or more models, one of the models must be a sergeant if available and one must be a banner bearer if available. So with just three we can choose and we're choosing a sergeant and two regular skeletons. So that is the setup. And since this scenario only has Three enemy squads, we do not need the initiative tracker for the group four enemies. For our actions, there are five basic things we can do. So for spinning a die with a one or higher, uh, we can make a move action. And that's gonna allow us to go the first number in our move slot, so he can move three spaces. So if it was here, he can go through the door, one, two, and three. Whenever you get into a spot adjacent to an enemy, that will end your movement. So if he had started here and went one, that would end the movement right there. We can run, spending a die with a cost of three or higher. We make a move action using our second number. Uh, so usually that's gonna be higher, but not always, but it's got the same restrictions. When you get adjacent to an enemy, that's gonna end your movement. Next thing you can do by spinning a die with a cost of one or up is recuperate. So if we had a damage token on us, we could look at our vitality. That's gonna let us know what die we would roll. On a success, we can remove one normal wound. If we roll a crit success, we can get rid of a grievous wound. So say we spin a die there and roll that, nothing happened. We'd have to keep on trying to heal. Searching, if we are adjacent to a mysterious object and we don't have any other enemies adjacent to us, we can search that with a die of four up and we'll just draw the top card from the deck and can be a crisis. So we have to resolve a crisis for our journey. There's also treasures in here and traps and roam stones that will get us some enhancements we keep that by the end of the game. We can have a max of one treasure card and one armor and one weapon. So something to keep track of when you have people searching. You can have multiple realm stone cards though. And the last basic action is extracting. So if we're in a space touching a closed gateway and there are no hostiles adjacent, we can place the extraction zone tile so that at least one space on it is touching the closed gateway and flip the closed gateway to its open side so we can get out of dodge after we've done our mission. So the other actions we have available to us are gonna be our weapon actions. So this is letting us know the Ardent Blade. We can use a action die of one up to take a, make a melee attack against an adjacent enemy. So in this case, if we were there, 
we could roll a die on a one or one success. We've just done two damage to that enemy. If it was a crit success, we do three damage. Judgment, we need to spend a die of five up. It's letting us know this weapon action can only be made once per turn. And for that, we're rolling two of the D8s. And that is not a very good roll, so we'd have to spend another die to do it again, but unfortunately we can only do that action once. And he's got a special ability, Firewood Stakes. This weapon action cannot be made by spending a die, so that's a unique ability he's got. Each time an attack roll made for this hero is successful, if the target is still visible, this hero can make one free Firewood Staked weapon action against the same target. So he could potentially put two or three damage in with the Ardent Blade and then one more damage with the stakes if it's successful. And then also on our cards, it's letting us know how we can get additional inspiration points. So each time a weapon action made by this hero slays a hostile champion, gain an inspiration point. So we can use inspiration points to, once we get three, we can flip over to our better side. Some other things we can do. Also with three points, we can do a search action when we're not next to a mysterious object. We can spin two, so we can do a gambit without spending activation dice, which we'll go over what a gambit is here in a little bit. Or we can pitch one to re-roll one of our action dice from a roll made from us. So we'll just set up for a hypothetical turn here. We'll say we're there. We started our turn rolling the dice, and these were the dice we have. Two threes, a four, and a six, and we want to go fight these guys here. Right now, we do not have line of sight to them. We either need to be adjacent to them from this room or in that room tile. So we can spend a three to run. We've got a movement of four. So we can go one, two, three, and just stop there since we're adjacent to an enemy. So if we're adjacent to an enemies, we can't do ranged attacks. We can only do melee and duel. And of course, if we're not adjacent to enemies, we can't do a melee attack, but we can do range and duel. So we'll say we moved here to be in a ranged area. We're gonna try, we're gonna spend a six to do the judgment action, rolling our two D8s. We got a crit success. Um, you just take the best die roll. So that does not equal eight damage. It's, we choose one of the dice there. So with that, we are doing four damage. These guys can take three wounds, so that four damage, one is dead. And we still have some dice left. So we can spin one more for some movement and use the other one for a melee attack, rolling the red die. And we got a success there. That does two damage, which is not enough to kill it. But with our special ability, each time an attack roll for this hero is successful, if it's still visible, which it is, this hero can make one free firewood stakes weapon. So we get to roll the d6 and hope for another hit. We did not get it. So that's going to end our activation. The end of the activation for all the health of the monsters we took care of, we get to roll a destiny die. If we roll equal to or less than that, we get an inspiration point. So three or less would have gotten us that but an eight will not do it. And like I said, we can use those inspiration tokens to help level up to get to our other side or other abilities throughout the game. All right, so for a basic turn structure, we can look on the back of the rule book. That's gonna go over each of the phases. Before we go through the phases, let's go over our objective. So in this, what we're trying to do is take down 10 champions. And here's a list of the champions we can take down. So for each champion we defeat, we're going to move our objective track and the ones with an asterisk. So if the wolf comes out or Vorg skiers, we get to advance the track twice instead of just once. So once we get this all the way around to 10, then we can go up to the top to find our drop ship and everyone needs to get on that to get out. Our victory conditions, the journey ends while there's at least one hero not out of action and 10 or more hostile champions have been slain. The heroes are successful and the other result is failure. The heroes are successful. They gain an experience. In addition, we shrink the influence by two. If the heroes fail. There are no additional penalties. 
After this journey, we grow fear by one. And remember, if any influence or fear gets us up to 10, we're done with the uh, whole scenario. So the five phases we have, we've got the journey phase, which is a nightfall step and a quest step. Then we have a destiny phase, initiative phase, which has activation roll step, initiative step, and a gambit step. And then the activation phase, where we will activate in initiative order, then an event phase. So for the journey phase, uh, the ninth step, all we do is advance the track by one. And if that ever gets up to nighttime, our monsters get a lot harder to take care of. The quest step, basically with that, the quest will let us know in the quest log if something happens there for the hunt, nothing's going on. Destiny phase, we're gonna take the five destiny dice and give them a roll. If we have any duplicates, they're gonna get discarded. That was a three. And any singles will become action dice that we can use with our characters. So each character can use a max of two, except for the one that acts last. He can use all the remaining destiny dice. Then we're gonna go through the initiative phase, so the activation roll step. Each character is gonna roll a number of dice equal to open spaces. So as we take wounds, that's gonna block spaces for our dice, so we'll get less activations. We'll go ahead and roll four for each of our characters here. So one, three, four, and six. Then Jelson, one, three, six, six. Dagni, one, two, three, five. And our Corpse Eater, three, three, six, six. Then we're gonna take our initiative cards. Like I said, they're gonna let us know when the enemies activate in our cells according to where we placed our tokens. Give that a shuffle. And so going first is going to be group monster one. And then we've got Glorio going with that symbol. Then group three of the monsters. Then that is Dagni. And that is Corpse Eater. And then last is Glorio. And then group two. So next is the gambit step. So with this, if any character doesn't like what they see here, they can roll or use one of their dice to roll whatever their agility is. On a success, they can exchange, let's say for some reason, he didn't like where he was at. So his agility is a D8. So he can roll the die on a success. He can swap with either the closest enemy on left or right side. We can choose either one. And on a crit success, he can swap that with any enemy group on the board. So hypothetically, not actually doing this, um, he could spin a die, roll, and he failed and nothing happened. If he would have rolled a success, he could have swapped with either of these. Say he didn't want to go second, he wanted to go third. He can do something like that. But I don't see a reason for doing that at the moment, and any of the heroes can do that. So once we are good with the initiative step, we go through the activation phase. So we're gonna activate each group and hero in that order. Then we'll go into the event phase, roll our lucky D12, and see what special event happens for the round. But since we have all this set up, I'll go ahead and go through one round here of activations, just to give you a better idea of how the game plays. So enemy group one is going first. They are the dead walker zombies. So what they have is a movement of two, takes three wounds to kill them, and they're small, which means they can have up to two in a square. Their weapon is hands and teeth. It's a melee action, rolling a D8. On a success, it does one damage. On a crit success, it does two. Um, we do have defense dice, so we can probably prevent some of those. Special rules for these guys. Gravestone models, see grave call below, are not hostiles, nor are they part of any hostile group. Heroes cannot enter the same space as a gravestone model. One small hostile can be in the same space as a gravestone model. A hero that is adjacent to a gravestone model can make a destroy using an action die of four up action. They do remove the gravestone model from the battlefield. 
So behavior, since these guys are activating, we're gonna roll our D12 and see what they do. So these guys rolled an eight, so they are going to charge us. So the basic actions they make is an advance action. So when they make an advance action, they're gonna make one move action and then one weapon action. And as soon as they, they're gonna to go towards the closest person and make that attack. Charge action, they're gonna make a two move actions and then one weapon action. So they're moving twice and their move is two. So one, two, one, two, and no one to attack and that one moves out. So that was lucky for us. And of course, neither of these are champions. So next up we have Jelson. He's back here. So the first thing he's doing is make a move. And a, using spinning a dive one up, he can move three spaces. If it's a three or up, he can move four spaces. So that's a run. So he's spinning one, he's got a movement of three. So one, two, and three. And then he's gonna make a ranged attack using judgment. So I need to spin a die with a five up. So we've got a six here, I'll spin that. Um, once again, his actions with that is this weapon action can only be made once per turn. It is ranged, so we can't attack something adjacent to us. We're rolling two D8s. On a success, we get two damage. On a crit success, four damage. And when we do roll our dice, it's not a combination of both. It's we pick the one die we likes the most. So if we got two crit successes, that's still just four damage, not eight. So he's going to target an enemy in his tile. And we got two crit successes. We'll use that one. So that's four damage. These guys only have three health, so that's one done. And he can't use that weapon again. So then he's going to spend a three, one, two to move adjacent to it. And then use the six to make a melee attack with his blade. Melee, getting to roll the red die. And crit success, another dead enemy. So at the end of our turn, we get a chance to go for inspiration. So we take the health value of the creatures we destroyed. So this is six health right there. And we roll our D12. So anything equal to six or less, we will get an inspiration. And we got a six. So he's one third of the way to flipping his card over. So now group three is gonna activate which is those guys up there. And the one without the helmet is what I'm calling the champion. So reading these guys, movement of three, takes two wounds to defeat and they're small, so they can be have two in the same spot. They've got a rusted weapon that's melee, rolling two D6s. Does one on a success, two on a crit success, special rules. How, so that's just bringing them out. So we brought out the one sergeant, banner bear, did not bring out. He re-roll failed attack rules for weapon actions made by Elfin Watch while the banner bear is visible to the acting hostile. And an Elfin Watch officer add one to the wounds value of the sergeant. So the sergeant takes three wounds to take him out. So their behavior is an 11. You don't want to roll high on these things. So Dance Macabre, each acting hostile makes a move action, then makes a charge action. So there, that guy's in trouble. Well, the only thing he's got going for him, only two of them are gonna be able to attack him because he's at that doorway. So move, one, two, three, charge, one, two, three. Still has another move action, but he's where he needs to be. So he's gonna make an attack action. Rolling two D6s. That's gonna do one damage. Now his defense is a D8. So we get to roll that. On a success, we block one. On a crit success, we block three. Uh, we didn't block any. So he is going to take a damage. And then one, two, three. 
One, two, three, and then another movement and an attack. Two blanks, we're good with that. And then this guy can't get in that space to attack. So that is Dagni coming up next. So the bad thing here is he's blocking our space to get in there. We do have a ranged weapon. So our first action is we're going to move. One, two, three. And we can target anything in this spot or in a door of another spot. So we're gonna use our harpoon gun. Need a four up die for that, so spending a five. Get to roll a red die. We're going after the sergeant. So we're taking a look here. Reel them in on that die. This weapon can only be made once per turn. If the attack roll is successful, you can pick an empty space within three spaces of the target that is near to this hero. Place the target in that space. So even if I can't kill him, I'm hoping I can hook him and pull him in next to us. Um, unique abilities. This ability can only be used once per turn. This hero is not adjacent to any hostile and is within five spaces of a visible mysterious object. You can make a search action as if they were adjacent to the mysterious object. In Vault of Mercantile Endeavors, this hero can keep up to two treasure cards instead of one and path to glory. Each time this hero draws a treasure or realm stone card from the discovery deck gains two inspiration points. So we're taking a shot at the champion and we missed. So then we're gonna get out of the way of the door or I guess it doesn't matter. We'll move one, two, three. And enter activation. So at the end of our turn, if we don't spend all our dice, we reduce them down to by one. So if it was a one, we just take it off the uh, chart there. Uh, we can use this to react. So basically on an enemy's turn, after they've completed a move or an attack action, we can spin that die to make a weapon action. So that's gonna allow me to make a melee attack if that champion comes up after us. So we're done with him. Now we're gonna have Corpse Eater go. He's all about melee, so he can't help it all there. But I think he might go after the champion up there. So we'll spend a three to run. Four spaces. One, two, three, four. Spend a three to run. One, two, three, four. Spending a six. So we'll take a look at his actions now. So one up, melee with two d8s. Marrow Masher, need a four up. Unique abilities. We're gonna do a tenderizing blow with a the six we just took. This action can only be made once per turn. This here makes a free attack up there. So that just means it's not an extra action. It's part of this main action. Reroll failed attack rolls for that action. That weapon action has damage value of three, five for that attack. He also has a shoulder barge, five up. Can only be used once per turn. This here makes a free run action. Can move to hostiles without ending that action. For that action, they can move through hostiles, but must end the action in an empty space. Then pick one hostile that was moved through, roll a, a D12, the red, roll successful, the hostile is stunned. Path to glory, been there and ate that. Making an inspiration roll, double the wounds value of all hostiles slain during this hero's activation. So he's rolling his red die against them. It's gonna be a three for a success and five damage for a crit success and we have one reroll. We'll take that for five damage. That guy has seven wounds. We'll just use a regular die for now. Then we're gonna spend another six to do the marrow masher so we can't, can't do this awesome ability again but we can keep doing that all day. So it's back down to a 2-4, and the 2 is going to be enough to kill it if we can roll better. All right, so he's used all his regular dice. We're going to spend some Destiny dice now. He's going to make another attack, so it's a 4-up, doing a Marrow Masher. 
and missing. Five up. Come on, dude. All right, so that does two damage, which is enough to take him down. And this is a champion. So we are one-tenth of the way done with our goal here. And when making an inspiration roll, we double the wounds value of the hostile slain during this activation. So that's 14. So he's definitely getting an inspiration because 11 or less. So he is done. And now our leader is going to go. Spinning a one for movement. One, two, three. Take a look at the rest of his stuff. So he's got a duel. Can only be made once per turn. Uh, unique abilities, duelists. This action can be made once per turn. This hero makes one free weapon action and one free move or run action. In any order, the free weapon action is his smaller weapon action. The attack roll success is treated as a crit. Path to glory. Each time a weapon action made by this hero slays the last hostile in a hostile group, gain an inspiration point. So he's going to shoot at the non-champion in the hopes of at least killing something. So spinning a three. It's a red and a d6. Crit success. Defeated. Then he's going to go run, spinning a four. So one, two, wait, one, two, three, four. Spinning a six to move again. Then we're going to spin this to search. And discovery crisis. Resolve one crisis for your journey from the quest book. So looking for our hunt journeys, hunt crisis table. We've got a daytime chart and a night chart. We're still in daytime, so rolling a d12. Got a seven. So we're going to page 28, looking for entry seven. And we've got dangers unnoticed. Hero spots a group of citizens moving noisily under a dark bridge. They appear to be unaware of the sleeping dire bats directly overhead. The acting hero must choose to ignore the citizens, approach them, or try to warn them from afar. If they choose to ignore the citizens, turn to entry 114. If they choose to approach, turn to 134. To choose to warn them from afar, go to 83. So we're going to go, we're going to approach the citizens. So we have effectively left the map. And then we're going to section 83. Here attempts to silently warn the citizens of danger above them. This is not as easy as you would like. Hopefully the citizens will not misinterpret the warning signals. The acting hero rolls a D8. Roll a... D12 instead, if they, you're a lower master or a blade. We are a blade, so rolling the red. And it's kind of on the side there. All right, so we've got a crit success. The roll is successful. The citizens understand the warning and quickly make their way out from under the bridge. The acting hero gains one inspiration point and the crisis ends. So we did well there. So when he would next activate, he will pop up on the board adjacent to any of our other heroes. So he is done. He took out this guy, which was two wounds. So if he can roll a two or less, he'll get another inspiration. He didn't. And then group one is going to activate, which has been taken out. So basically, if a third or less of the group remains, they are going to be driven off. So basically, if any is left on there and they're not stunned, they'll make an attack and then they're leaving. Then we're going to remove any remaining miniatures and then replace the group's encounter card on the track with the next card face down. And that's going to end the activation. So these guys go away. That gets discarded. And we get a new level one that's going to be a surprise later. 
So we have finished the activation phase, so the event phase. We go to the event table, rolling our D12. We rolled a five, which means crisis. Resolve one crisis for your journey from the quest book. So we're gonna go back through and do another crisis. And then we're gonna rinse and repeat until we get our goal of 10 monsters. Go open the door in the back and everyone get on that to get on our spaceship and get out of here. So at the end of a journey, we have to go through these following steps. So determine success, look back to request and go through with the victory conditions. Uh, so that could change our quest track. And we're going to resolve an extraction event. So we're gonna roll quest dice and look up the results on the table over here. So add one to the roll if we were successful and add one if it was still daytime. So assuming we went through this and we were successful still in daytime, we'd add two to this roll. So we'd end up with a nine and we'd follow what happened down here, shrink the influence by one. So that's nice. Determine your survival. If any of our characters got knocked out, We'd roll a die, and if it's a one, then they are dead, and they no longer return to the game. So if we get down to having only three heroes left, and we can't fulfill a full group, then we've lost the mission, and we get to start all over again. Remove tokens and counters. Resolve our consequences from the journey we went on. Increasing a hero's level. So after every quest, each hero is going to get a novice token. Then if they've got a novice, they complete another quest. They go up to another token, complete another quest, then they become first level. Once they start getting levels, they're going to get traits to make them a little bit better in what they're doing. Then next, if we have any realm stone, we can spend that to get empowerments for our characters to increase their armor and weapon efficiency. And then if we have any Realmstone left over, we do not get to keep it. Uh, that goes back to the Sky Vessel so it can stay repaired and afloat. Then we'll come back and pick another quest to go on. And like I said, the journeys, basically, let's see, let's go to take a quick look at these journeys. So doing the hunt journeys, we're gonna shrink influence by two if we're successful. And they're gonna be have maps to come out for those. Then we have scavenge journeys. And completing those, they're more for upping your gear. So we're gonna grow fear and influence by one, but hopefully get a lot of gear upgrades. And those are dedicated maps. Then we have deliverance journeys, which will shrink fear by two and grow influence. And those do not have dedicated maps. And then we have decapitation journeys. So that's taking out the guys we need to, to ultimately win in the cursed city. So hopefully that gives you a good understanding of Warhammer Quest, The Cursed City, and the process of playing the game. A lot of components, but when you break it down, fairly simple mechanics to play with. So as always, hope you enjoyed this video. So please click on the like button below and be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.